Okay, thank you everyone. I'd now like to invite Adam Borison um, from Nathan Associates, the kind sponsors of this panel, to come onto the screen and set the scene for the panel. Thank you, Adam, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar on electric mobility, uh, investing in transportation electrification and building the business case for e-mobility. Uh, I appreciate very much uh, everyone taking the time. We have a good turnout, uh, happy to see that and very much appreciate everyone taking the time to, uh, to tune in uh, for our webinar. Um, I'm not going to take too much of the time. I think we have a spectacular panel, so I want to make sure they have plenty of time. Uh, I'll introduce myself briefly and mention the panelists. So uh, I'm Adam Borison, uh, long history in, in consulting, uh, work with a firm called Nathan Associates. We are a international economic development firm, and I'm the leader of the electric mobility practice. Um, uh, we have, a, as I said, a, a spectacular panel. Uh, what we try to do is bring in people that represent, uh, in many ways, the, a broad spectrum of the electric mobility, let's call it the ecosystem. Uh, so I'll introduce briefly uh, our panelists. Uh, we have the uh, Honorable Minister uh, Stephen Myers uh, from Prince Edward Island. Uh, some very exciting news there about recent developments in e-mobility. So uh, he's here to, to talk both about that and more generally about electric mobility there. We have Roger Todd. Uh, with the uh, Transportation Department in Bermuda. And again, they have some exciting news, uh, recent developments. I, I think he can talk about that as well as other activities in Bermuda. Uh, we have Marcelino Madrigal. Dr. Madrigal uh, is uh, the or a or the leader uh, of electric mobility for the IDB. And IDB has been very active, as he will talk about, uh, in supporting electric mobility in Latin America. Uh, we have Joe Edgehill, a co-founder and director of Megapower, and I think arguably Megapower is the leading uh, firm in electric mobility in the Caribbean, private firm doing that. Uh, and again, has ex excellent experience. We'll talk about where that's going. And then lastly, Eric Wenick uh, with WRB uh, Partners. Uh, WRB has been investing in energy uh, in the Caribbean and elsewhere uh, for many years. And they can talk about their experience in, um, uh, in, in the Caribbean and elsewhere in electric mobility. So that's a quick uh, rundown of the panelists. And again, as I said, I'll try to make sure they have plenty of time uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, for them to give their views and then, then of course have quick Q&A. So um, let, me, let me spend just 30 seconds or a minute. Uh, uh, it gets a probably, probably a diverse audience. I'd like to just very quickly lay out in very simple terms, uh, the motivation behind this webinar. Uh, perhaps obvious, uh, perhaps not obvious, but, uh, but let me just be very clear about that. Um, I think it's widely recognized, and, and uh, I have to admit that I came to this a bit late in some, in some ways. It's widely recognized that if we want to solve the climate problem, we have to decarbonize transport. I think, uh, as most people know, transport is a big share, perhaps a quarter or more of GHG emissions. And so we just have to basically solve the transport problem if we're going to do something about climate. Um, to do that, to solve the transport problem, you're gonna take money, right? Take investment. Uh, so you go from climate to transport to investment. And that's why we're here. We're here to talk about how one can make investments in electric transport that ultimately will help solve uh, the climate issue as well as other issues. But that's the core, that's the motivation behind this. Um, let me just talk again briefly about the agenda and so we can jump in uh, quickly. So I'm going to give each of the panelists uh, several minutes, seven or eight minutes to give their perspective on electric mobility and to talk specifically if they can about what I call the business case, where things are going investment wise. Uh, we'll go through the, the panelists uh, on that topic. Then we have Q&A and I remind you to, if you, if you have interesting questions and might want to uh, get some response from the panelists, you can use the Q&A button and you can basically, I'll be looking through those and trying to identify those that are the you know, most appropriate questions. But that will be a, there'll be a session of Q and A, uh, so we can hopefully get some feedback uh, on those kinds of issues from our panelists. And then towards the end, uh, a few words about lessons learned or recommendations going forward. Uh, well, a brief time, I think, uh, to for the panelists to talk a bit about that. And then essentially, I'll I'll try to wrap up with a little bit of guidance going forward. So that's kind of the agenda. Um, 
And with that, um, uh, uh, James, I think if we'd like to do uh, the, uh, for the the poll that I put together, we'd like to do that now before we jump into the, uh, or do you want, should we do that now? Uh, let's do that before the Q&A after Q &A. the- Okay, fine, well, we'll do that. So what I'd like to do then is let's jump in uh, immediately uh, to uh, the panelists to go through uh, one by one uh, their perspective on the issues. I'd like to start with uh, the Honorable Minister, Stephen Myers, who is the Minister, I believe, it's of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action uh, on Prince Edward Island in Canada, and as I said, has some exciting developments uh, there. All right, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and I'm excited to be here today. Uh, um, I'll talk a little bit about wh who we are and how we got here, and then I'll kind of get into what the parts that everybody really wants to hear about, but Prince Edward Island is a, is a small, it's a small province in, in Canada. We're 5,660 square kilometers. Um, we have 5,600 kilometers of roads, however, and um, we, we don't have a real transit system on, in the province. So our, our number one contributor to uh, carbon emissions ha has been our transit on, on BEI, which is at 44%. Um, but a, a number of months of, ago, we started down this path to what we're calling the pathway to net zero, but it's the, the, our pathway to carbon neutrality, which is uh, what many jurisdictions uh, around the world are, are moving towards. And in Canada, we've adopted the, uh, the Paris Accord, which sets us on a goal to be there by 2050. Our goal, however, because of the size of our jurisdiction and because of the, the lack of big industry like we would see in other parts of Canada, uh, we set our goals to be at 2040, but by 2030, we intend to be um, carbon neutral as far as, as energy goes. So we're calling it net zero energy, which includes our electrical grid, which is currently made up of 27% uh, uh, renewable, but it's it's over 80% is from clean sources, now our non-carbon non emitting sources, uh, including some nuclear that's not in our province, it's in a, a neighboring province. Um, but that, that goal is ambitious and that energy goal will also include um, transportation, which is, like I said, our number one emitter. So for, for us as a province, we have 130,000 vehicles on, uh, on our road currently, and I have the numbers here, 81 of them are battery EVs, 85 are plug-in hybrid EVs, and uh, 862 are straight hybrids. So out of 130,000 vehicles, we're we're lacking a lot. And that's probably why our emissions are 44% from transportation. As I noted, outside of the, the cities, which wouldn't be major cities compared to other jurisdictions, we don't have any transit. So there's no bus system that, that goes from tip to tip. Though, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll touch on, on that part too, that our uh, part of our, our current effort to decarbonize our transportation system includes our, our buses. So just recently, we took possession of uh, 12 school buses, which is the first of 320 school buses that are going to be fully electric. So we um, went to RFP and Lion Bus Company from Quebec with one, and they're one of the premier electric bus companies in, uh, in North America. Um, so there's 12 of them on the road right now. And by the end of our project, we'll have 320, which is all of our school buses on Prince John. Our plans are to use those electric school buses as well to, to run a rural um, transit pilot that would be an non-emitting transit transit pilot to move people around our, our province. And um, that will help lower, we, we believe that'll help lower our emissions um, significantly if we can get people to, to, to use that and move away from the, the car culture. But the, uh, the initiative that we, you know that we're kind of currently on and the one that we're here to talk about right, right today is our our move to um to, to electric vehicles on you know on our whole transit system so there's a, a few things and i guess that everybody who's on here probably know, knows these things but the the uh literature on ev adoption are not there's th three principles that are kind of guiding us here is one a purchase incentive so number one is a purchase incentive and that's what we've done uh, number two is public education, and we have a component here, public education, that I'm also going to talk about. And the third is public charging infrastructure, which I can also talk about uh, with our province. So we'll start with our purchase incentive. So recently we announced our purchase, purchase incentive, which is 
$5,000 for a full electric vehicle. And in, in Canada, the federal government has a $5,000 incentive as well. So if you buy a new vehicle off the lot here in Prince of Wales, you will get $10,000 off your uh, electric vehicle. Our, our rebate is at purchase. So it, our rebate will be to the, to the car sales company. And uh, that's so that you know, the purchaser doesn't have to finance while they wait for getting their money back. <clears throat> Um, but the, what, one of the things that we did, which we thought were important, we're, we're a smaller jurisdiction. As I noted, we don't have the industry there, you know, other jurisdictions in Canada have. And uh, because of that, sometimes we have a lower median income than you would see in other parts of Canada. Cause I you know, think people who aren't intimately familiar with Canada, you know, we're, we're viewed as a rich country, which we are, but that doesn't necessarily, um, mean it's in every province and we're one of the ones that I would call have not. Um, so what we did was we included the same incentive for a used vehicle. So if you can buy a used vehicle on the lot here in Prince Rhode Island, get $5,000 off uh, a used vehicle as well. We have uh, a company who is set up, uh, all EV they're called, they're a company that is in our jurisdiction in three provinces. And they're working really hard to bring in used vehicles to move. They just opened a new location um, because of this announcement. I think that the that's a, an integral part for us too, so that we don't just get people that are on the upper pay scales into an electric vehicle, because it's important for us for our first 10 year goals that we get everybody into it. So while it sounds like a really ambitious goal and it probably is, we're gonna do everything we can to get everybody uh, to electrify their transportation by 2030. The public education, we have, uh, because I'm the minister also responsible for climate change, climate action, I, I guess it is now, but, um, we, we have an incentive in place. It's basically a, a climate challenge fund. So companies can submit their ideas to us on, on how they would help tackle climate change through initiatives of their own and we will, would help fund them. And one of the, the uh, company who I spoke of, All EV, who is the electric, used electric vehicle, vehicle company, put in a program that we've funded and the, the program is basically to, I think they call it uh, Create EV Aware. It's a Create EV Awareness Program. So they're gonna take electric vehicles from tip to tip on our island and, uh, and set up opportunities for people to come see them, drive them, see what they're like, ask the experts about things like range anxiety and how far they will go and, and, uh, and that type of thing. Um, the other part is, you know, we're building, we're gonna help build a business case and, and all EV is gonna help us build a business case. And business case basically is the, the low maintenance cost of an electric vehicle, low operating cost of electric vehicle and the, the total cost of, of ownership. So, um, you know, there's, there's several reasons that I know I, I was at it. I heard the speaker in New York or probably five years ago talk, talk about the move to electric vehicles and how quickly anticipates it will happen. And I, you know, I'm in that camp where I believe that is gonna happen. We're gonna help it along. But uh, one of the things that always stuck with me is the, the low number of moving parts in electric vehicles. So there's so, fewer things that could go wrong with an electric vehicle. I think as we make people understand that the total ownership cost is gonna be lowered, that we're gonna be able to help move people into it. The final part is the, and it's a really important part, is the public charging infrastructure. So part of our EV program is anybody who buys an electric vehicle gets a free home charger. So I think that's a, also an important part. So we have a free home charger that you charge at home, but we need a public system as well. So we have 60 uh, chargers on the, on the island, like I said, we're we're just over 5,500 square kilometers. So we're not huge. We're gonna to continue to expand that over the next number of years so that we can have a, a really, really healthy charging system on, on Prince of So I think though, those are our business cases. That's how we got here. Uh, we're excited about it. And you know, maybe uh, you know, five years from now, I'll be happy to report that our 44% of total emissions will be way down. And instead of being our number one, it's down to our number three. And uh, I think this is very important for us to meet our, our carbon goals. So, so thank you for the opportunity. And I just want to end it with my saying that anybody that's out there who, you know, wants to hear from us one-on-one -on -one or wants to hear, talk to some of their, our experts, which I'm not an expert in anything, I'm a politician, um, feel free to reach out through the, the group here to get my contact information. And we'd be more than happy to do stuff with your organization or with your group or one-on-one, -on -one, whatever it takes, because I believe this is a, a global problem. It's not just a, PEI problem. So thank you. Mr. Myers, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, great. I think uh, 
uh, for those of you that that are uh, looking for interesting ideas and, and directions to go in, I think I was very interested to hear about the used car rebate because I think that's a very hot area, a hot topic, and maybe controversial topic to to, to give uh, low income people maybe e equal access to electric vehicles. So I was very excited to hear about that, and perhaps other people can get can get some lessons from you about that. That's a very interesting area. So let me move on to our next speaker, uh, Roger Todd, uh, Director of Public Transportation in Bermuda. And again, uh, as I mentioned, I think that there's some interesting developments in Bermuda, more on the fleet side, maybe also the vehicle side. Uh, let's hear from Roger. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Roger Todd. I'm the director at the Department of Public Transportation in Bermuda. Um, at, the, at the department, we have uh, embarked on a journey to zero emissions for the public bus fleet. And the way that we went about this is the government committed to a a policy of supporting and transitioning to zero emissions and, and primarily electric vehicles. And we recognize that fleet operations is an excellent platform to launch, to expose uh, the public to modern electric vehicles and to de-risk uh, the introduction of electric vehicles. Also to uh, achieve consolidated information with respect to the performance of those vehicles in the in the initial fleets. And so with the government taking the lead in terms of policy, then the department uh, is also taking the lead as one of the largest uh, fleets in operation on the island. And so to do that, we partnered with a, a nonprofit entity out of the US called Rocky Mountain Institute, and they have lent some impressive intellectual horsepower to the initiative. Um, resources are always a constraint. And so when you have the opportunity to uh, partner strategically with, with entities that can, can bring different skill sets and different exposures to bear, it really helps to move the initiative forward. So in October of 2018, the government of Bermuda entered into a um, MOU with the Rocky Mountain Institute to pursue um, renewable energy for the island as well as electrification and decarbonization of the fleet. So in 2019, uh, in collaboration, we launched, the government launched an RFI. Because we have been procuring pretty much the same uh, diesel buses, albeit transitioning towards a Euro 6 type diesel, but more or less the same platform of bus for many, many years. And there's some value to standardization, but there's also a risk that you get stuck. You get stuck in a routine, you get stuck in a rut, and you lose track of what the market is doing and where the market is. So we thought it was prudent to go out with a low emissions RFI for um, appropriately sized buses for Bermuda. And that, that is a challenge because we cannot accommodate the standard 2.4, 2.5 meter wide bus. And so immediately we're looking at a narrow body bus, but we're also looking at things like accessibility which is important to, to the people and to the government. Um, so with all of these factors combined, um, we were able to test the market across the globe. We got some very, very interesting submissions. Some products were in development phase and um, much to our surprise, we, we always uh, had operated on a bespoke uh, bus design, but we found that there were some buses in the market that were production vehicles that were electric vehicles and that provided for um, some of our objectives but by being a production vehicle it also meant that the, the vehicles were available at significantly lower cost and significantly shorter lead time and so this was an opportune time to sort of make a transition and the business case for electrification because not only are you going from diesel to electric but you're potentially going from a, a, an expensive bespoke product to something that is a, a more of a production vehicle that's available at a lower cost. The other, the other factor that was interesting was where the products were coming from. And um, we had traditionally dealt a lot with Europe and the UK being a, a UK dependent territory. Um, Bermuda interacts economically uh, very quickly with um, I mean, very frequently with the U.S., with Canada, with um, the U.K. Uh, however, what, what we learned through this exercise also is that the world 
is getting smaller in terms of logistics, in terms of business, um, thanks to technology. And um, we were able to engage with some interesting suppliers direct out of China, and that also contributed significantly to lower cost options. And what we saw was there was a much higher deployment of vehicles in coming out of China, electric vehicles. And so the development, the technology, and the options that were available were just broader out of that particular region. There were some really, really good products coming out of other regions, but um, they, the, the level of deployment for those products was significantly lower. So those were some of the things we learned with the RFI. In 2020, we then launched an RFP um, for 30 low emissions, the initial procurement of 30 um, low emissions buses, and the winning uh, bid was actually an electric bus, which was out of China. And so in 2021, the cabinet approved the contract for uh, the initial procurement of electric buses, and we are currently in the process of procuring our initial electric buses. Along with that is the charging infrastructure. And so right now we are uh, finalizing the procurement and selection of the charging infrastructure vendor, which obviously is not just the charging pedestal, but it's also the load management system and the infrastructure that has to come from the substation to the depot. Now, I should um, qualify that Bermuda is a relatively small island. We are about 21 square miles, or perhaps about 22 miles long, and a mile and a half at its widest point. So for anybody who hasn't been to Bermuda, you know, that, that gives some context. Where that plays into the electrification favor is that range anxiety doesn't exist in Bermuda. It, it may just from a psychological point of view that people need to get used to it, but once you've driven an electric vehicle for two weeks in Bermuda and realized that you only had to charge it once, then range anxiety quickly becomes a non-issue. So from charging infrastructure uh, on the residential side, it's very easy to accommodate charging at home. And on the fleet operations side, if home is the depot, then our initial um, efforts are to focus on depot charging and to integrate or, or modify our bus schedules such that it accommodates the, the depot charging as opposed to opportunity charging. Um, Rocky Mountain Institute is still in partnership with the government of Bermuda, and they have largely moved their efforts now toward the broader government fleet. And this is important because the exposure and the de-risking, um, so for someone who may support electrification, but individually you don't want to take on the, the early adoption risk, um, then by the government taking that on and other large fleet operators such as the utility um, converting their fleet to electric where possible, then that really helps to um, test the technology, prove the technology, and debunk, debunk some of the, the myths associated with, with electrification. Um, with that said, uh, I think that's my seven minutes. I do have uh, quite a few comments in terms of some of the topics that the specific questions that we wanted to talk about, such as the cost benefit and who makes the commitments up front and different things of that nature. But I really wanted to get in first with an overview of what's happening in Bermuda and perhaps in the Q and A in the Q and A session is when we can um, explore some of those points. Yes, th thank you so much. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, I appreciate your efforts to, to cover all that ground. Uh, incredibly good news, interesting news uh, between you and uh, the minister. I think it's really, uh, I think, very, very positive to hear both on the individual vehicle side, where that's appropriate, and on the fleet side, which is incredibly important internationally. Uh, so I think that's great to hear that. And hopefully we'll have more time to cover some of the specific topics that, you know, the questions and answers on the specific investment and business issues that we've raised. So uh, let me keep the ball rolling. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Madrigal uh, from IDB. 
as I said, leading the effort uh, in IDB uh, across Latin America in electric mobility, very exciting area, uh, Dr. Madrigal. Uh, thanks so much and thanks for my, my colleague speakers. Um, what I will try to do also in my seven minutes is to provide an overview of what we are doing and what I think is, is key to, to move ahead in, in, in the islands. You know, over the past few years, we are working in more than 18 countries. We have more than 40 activities all related to electric mobility and basically in two fronts, you know, providing technical assistance, policy support to, to go governments, private sector, but also providing uh, financing on the, on the technical assistance side, side uh, uh, supporting governments developing, you know, national policies, roadmaps for electromobility. Uh, Dominican Republic recently issued the strategic plan for electric mobility, which we were glad to support. And we're working on that front in Jamaica and also in, in Barbados. So this is the, the big policy decisions on why it's important electromobility, the cost, the benefits, and why you should have a, a plan. That's the higher level policy decisions that we are supporting with technical assistance, many governments. We're also supporting on the regulatory front, and believe it or not, uh, I think this is key in the Caribbean. Energy regulators have a lot to play on making sure, especially charging infrastructure is developed in a dynamic way with collaboration from public and private sector. And that is becoming in some cases a roadblock. And I will provide some ideas on, on how, on how um, uh, to move. Also, we have uh, worked with many countries on designing uh, you know, financing and business models for buses, because as we just heard, buses already make sense economically over the life of, of the bus, you just need to find the proper mechanism to distribute the risk between the, the players, which is the bus operator, the technology provider, the electricity provider. And we have uh, you know, supported governments to define a business scheme that distributes the risk and makes viable bringing you know, finance to, to a service that is higher in capital cost, but at the end of the life, it really makes sense. You know, Electric buses, electric cars over the life, of the, of the asset already makes sense. So the, the issue of cost benefit is not really a question for this type of applications, buses, short run uh, uh, electric uh, car use. On the, on the financing side, uh, you know, we were pioneers at financing the first electric buses in Latin America. And this is like eight years ago where, you know, we tested that yes, indeed they save you like 80% of fuel or even close to 85 or 90% and they save emissions. Uh, pollutants, 80%. So it, it's clear, this has been tested. The economic benefits are, are clear and also the environmental benefits. Th th there is no question if they work or not because even in places where the energy system is supplied by uh, more than 50% of fossil fuels, it still you save emissions. Why? Because you know electric cars are really efficient, 80% efficient versus 20% efficient at combustion cars. So even in cases where your electricity grid uh, does not have a, a lot of renewables, it is still makes sense. Of course, you need to move also with the renewables agenda is very important because then the benefits amplify. Um, on the financing side, uh, uh, we have different windows, private, public sector, capital markets. We have finance, uh, you know, public sector, uh, for instance, in Costa Rica, the deployment of the whole national electric charging system for Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a larger country, but similar to an island where you uh, still, you really need, you know, a fast charging network. We provided financing to, to public sector entities there and also to uh, financing the fleets of, of public sector uh, institutions, which I, I think is key, as I will mention before. We have also provided, you know, very recently uh, through the capital markets uh, area of the bank financing for, for Peru and Ecuador in the order of 20 and 30 million dollars for financing electromobility solutions, especially buses, uh, taxis, and, and fleets, which is where, where financing al already makes sense. We would like to see more of that in the Caribbean, more on the financing side. And I think this is why it's important to, to accelerate in, in some key policy areas. You know, just two years ago, we released a report on uh, the electrified islands of the Caribbean together with the Organization of the American States and the dialogue. And, and in that study, which is quite recent, you know, two years ago, uh, we list the barriers and one that was surprising in the Caribbean uh, or in islands uh, versus other countries is awareness, technology. It seems uh, different parties uh, still do not know the technology, electric cars, electric buses, they do work. They have run millions of kilometers in, 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 in the world. 
but the issue of awareness is still a barrier in many in many islands. So I think we need to work on that. I will provide some ideas. Uh, concerns also from governments on losing revenue from taxes of that are applied to, to, to gasoline, to fuels that power the transportation system, uh, especially now with you know, the fiscal constraints uh, during this emergency, governments are concerned about that. And we have uh, made analysis, uh, just understanding how big is that and when really the impacts happen. Um, very good news, the benefits are always great, even if you include you know, incentives, uh, tax, import duty, uh, reductions for, for electric transportation, and I will mention that, and charging infrastructure, which for some islands, small ones should not be an issue, for others is important, and I think we need to work on that. So quickly, on, on the uh, awareness, I think what we just heard from Bermuda needs to happen more. The public sector institutions should be a leader on this. You know, bring some electric cars, uh, so that people see the technology, uh, replace your old, you know, gasoline consuming cars in, in government offices and uh, buildings because you are spending more money in reality. So even replacing an old car with an electric car, even used one, a used, a used electric car is much better than a used combustion car. You will save money. So it's a prudent fiscal decision to go and buy electric car fleet, fleets for the public sector. We need to do more of that. We are working right now in, in this area, for example, with Jamaica bringing some electric cars so that uh, different stakeholders see them, they work, install the charging infrastructure. So we're working on that, on awareness, which is key on, 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 on the Caribbean. Uh, also on the charging infrastructure, and I will you know, mention about those uh, later, we have made some studies you know, for, for the Caribbean. If you put incentives there, uh, you could save $2.2 billion in the Caribbean if you achieve 10, uh, 1 million electric cars versus 10,000 that you will achieve if you do nothing. And you will save money even putting incentives. I will then later talk about you know, other strategies to, to solve the charging infrastructure puzzle, but the benefits to governments to put incentives are great. Uh, regionally, those have been computed uh, in, in the Caribbean as a whole and in Jamaica as a whole, but I, I will leave those maybe for, for, for the next round uh, uh, of, of discussion. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Marcelino, thank you so much. Uh, again, uh, incredibly exciting to hear about all the work that you're doing and, and I think your optimism going forward. And again, uh, right on as far as topics are concerned, how do we finance this? Uh, very, very important. And it was really interesting to hear what you're doing and what you plan on doing in that area. So that was great. Uh, I'd also like to mention to the audience, um, I really appreciate the Q&A uh, um, and we're gonna do our best, I think, to uh, summarize some of those uh, many, many questions and, and ask our panelists some of the higher level, broader questions. But I also will work with James uh, following this uh, to get some specific answers to you either directly or from the panelists on some of the detailed questions. So again, I really, really appreciate the, the level of enthusiasm and, and, and uh, energy, uh, so to speak, behind this. Uh, and we'll do our best both to answer some of those questions here and then follow on uh, after the, the, the webinar is over. So with, without uh, more uh, de delay, let me introduce our, our next speaker, Joe Edgehill. And as I said, Joe, uh, founder, co-founder and director of Megapower, uh, she'll speak for herself about this. Uh, I think, as I said, arguably the leader in in really doing electric mobility in the Caribbean. Adam, thank you for your kind introduction. Um, Megapower focuses on promoting the uptake of electric vehicles powered by renewable sources. We are in our eighth year of operation, headquartered in Barbados with a permanent office in Antigua. I'm joining you this morning from an ash-filled Barbados, and it's felt like a rail slap in the face to business coming out of a series of lockdowns in Barbados, feeling that we would finally be back up and running. But my heart goes out to St. Vincent, where it must truly be horrific. In the last few years, we have sold a few vehicles into St. Vincent. And one thing I've been reflecting on is, unlike gasoline vehicles, with um, uh, an intake manifold, electric vehicles only have the air intake for the AC. So hopefully they'll be, they'll be doing a bit better than, than some of the other vehicles in St. Vincent. 
In the past, I've spoken about the importance of partnerships, and I'm not going to harp on about that this morning. I'm just going to talk very briefly and then tell you what I really believe has been fundamental to the growth and actually survival of Megapower in what's been a very challenging year. So in terms of partnerships, I've spoken about partnerships with electric utilities, um, electric utilities being a real beneficiary really for electric vehicles. Every person plugging in is, is another source of revenue for them. Um, partnerships with governments. And here in Barbados, we are fortunate to have a very clear energy policy with an estimated 2 billion US to be invested or needed to be invested by the year 2030. So for those of you out there looking for potential investments, I mean, please, Barbados um, has this clear energy policy. And in terms of electric mobility, 25% of our vehicle sales um, at Megapower were to government departments and agencies. So I can honestly say our government is very serious about electric mobility. Uh, partnerships with private sector, partnerships with landowners, partnerships with multilateral organizations such as IDB. And, and one such partnership really stands out to me. So through a loan from the IDB, the government of Barbados and the National Petroleum Corporation are undertaking a pilot with six electric vehicles. And that's been going, we're now in the second year of that. But if when I started the business in 2013, someone would say to me, hey, you know, the um, oil company is going to buy electric vehicles, I would have said never. So that partnership with IDB and the partnership with the government really has, has been tremendous. Um, partnerships also with finance institutions, and these are ongoing for us, as well as partnerships with insurance companies. And there's so much more scope for developing electric vehicle um, specific products, both in terms of leases, loans, the insurance, um, and then, you know, other, other finance options to maybe own for shorter periods of time as well. So I think there's a lot of potential there for growth, but those partnerships to date have been, have been important. Um, what has really, I don't know, solidified our company and our ability to, to pivot, to change, to grow has been the importance of looking at different revenue streams. So there's six really that we have currently at Megapower. And even within those six, I'm looking at how do we expand? You know, what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? You know, that point of also looking at this could be a revenue stream, but will it really help grow the business? Will it detract from our vision um, or, or will, it, will it be good? So our revenue streams are vehicle sales. And in Barbados, there are over 600 electric vehicles now on the road, and this includes 35 BYD um, K8RA electric buses within the transport board fleet. Um, it includes about 100 MG, which is a mid-size SUV vehicles, and we only introduced them last year. So to have sold 100 MGs, put them on the road, you know, within a 12-month period, and indeed the last 12-month period has, has really been great. Um, there are also about 80 Nissan vans and then about 350 other electric vehicles on the road. Um, vehicle maintenance, so we run a full workshop for the vehicles that we sell, ensuring that our technicians are trained and also working with the manufacturers to deliver their maintenance schedules. EV accessories and charging accessories, um, as well as actually owning, operating and running an EV charging network ourselves. And you can look at this on plugshare.com, which is a universal app. We've got over 35 publicly accessible locations across Barbados. This by no stretch of the imagination is a, is a money spinner. It is not. Um, it is very much a loss leader, but a crucial part of building the business case for electric mobility. Um, Finally, EV battery reuse and special projects. And within special projects, that's our renewable energy arm. So rolling out solar carports with charging infrastructure in some cases and solar PV installations to ensure that every vehicle that we put on the road is net offset by the renewable energy that we put back into the grid. 
So it's been these revenue streams that have really enabled electric mobility to, um, to flourish in, in Barbados, along with those partnerships I mentioned earlier. Um, and, you know, we are very much open to new ideas. We've been looking at leasing of vehicles. Um, that's very cash flow intensive, but actually it's also very lucrative. So how do we balance that? We have a, a lease as a pilot with DHL and we're data collecting on how that's going and deciding what to do next. But Barbados has no car sharing. So electric vehicle car sharing, very few of the rental companies rent electric vehicles. I think there's only two um, electric vehicles that I can think of that are in rental fleets. And so there's a lot of opportunity still. I see us very much still in infancy in year eight, but we have made good progress and we do have partnerships here in Barbados and these revenue streams, which hopefully will, will take us forward, ash or no ash. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, very interesting to hear. I, I was uh, very interested to hear about your revenue streams and I like, you know, the very practical. The sustainability also means economic sustainability. Uh, not just environmental sustainability, social sustainability. So the attention to you know, where do we make money? Where does that money go? Can we act survive? Uh, I'm really glad to hear that you are surviving, uh, particularly under the current conditions. So I hope you uh, you make it out of uh, your ash. What is today? Ash Wednesday, I guess. So uh, pretty much so, uh, make it make it past that. Um, so uh, again, without uh, more ado, I'd like to introduce our like uh, last speaker, uh, Eric Wenick. Uh, as I said, WRB. I've, I've met them, uh, their folks, many times at various conferences uh, where we focus a great deal on the investments in renewables on the islands. And I understand they're also now looking seriously at electric mobility investments. So with that, without any more uh, introduction, Eric. Great. Thank you, Adam. And uh, thank you to all the, the panelists who have spoken up until now. Uh, you had some great ideas and it's very exciting to hear about what's going on in, in your jurisdiction. Um, so, so there was a, a, a lot of optimism and uh, a lot of progress and what people have spoken about uh, so far on the panel. I'll, I'll take a little bit different tack. Um, and I'll start off by saying, first of all, that um, you know, we as an investment firm are incredibly uh, excited about and optimistic about uh, the, the future and in investing in e-mobility. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll maybe point out some of the things uh, since we have a, uh, a panel of, of people from government and from multilateral finance agencies and from the private sector, um, you know, where maybe we can all work together a little bit more and remove some barriers that, um, that exist today um, that have, you know, frankly, prevented us from being more aggressive in uh, pursuing investments in the e-mobility sector. So uh, it, the, I guess the two headers I would put on uh, maybe some of the barriers that I see are uh, scale or lack thereof, especially on uh, smaller islands, and then uh, complexity, which also ties back into the scale. So, uh, so we as an investment firm, just to size it up, are, are looking to write equity checks anywhere from call it five to 15 million which generally speaking um, it then creates a, a, a total portfolio of assets of call it 15 to 50 or $60 million when you include uh, debt financing on the assets. So, so that across a number of, of different, um, uh, call it decarbonization uh, technologies uh, is, is very right sized for um, some of the smaller economies in, in Latin America, like, like a Costa Rica, um, or, or other countries in Central America, um, or for a municipality looking to uh, deploy electric vehicles, uh, and also for many of the islands in, in the Caribbean. Um, but um, what, you know, in, in order to invest a significant amount of capital, though, at once, um, it, you know, what, what we really find is that you know, for, for most countries, um, you'd have to assume that you capture. You know, essentially, um, all of the market uh, for for electric vehicles uh, or and the related infrastructure. So, um, I think what that really speaks to, especially in smaller countries, is the need for um, potentially pursuing this as uh, a, a true private-public partnership um, with a capital source and and the government and and other local constituencies. 
Um, we have done that before in our operating history and, and our bent um, in, in investing is towards longer term investments. Uh, so we, um, as, as a firm, have, have op owned and operated uh, three of the utilities in the Caribbean over time. And uh, our investment periods for those have, have been 10, 20, and 30 years. Uh, so we, we truly do have a long-term outlook and can take a long-term view and, and really like to become um, a, a member of the community over the long-term. Um, but, uh, but again, in, in order to attract in, any sort of capital at scale, um, I, I think in the smaller markets, uh, you really have to go in with a, a view towards um, uh, a, a government or a utility partnering with one provider. Um, because it frankly, just in, in many markets or for many um, investment opportunities, uh, the prospect of, of a lot of competition or having multiple players uh, is, is a real dampener uh, and, and creates a, a pretty negative investment scenario. And that, that bleeds into the complexity issue. So um, you know, I think everybody's aware that it sometimes takes just as much work and spending and upfront planning to, to write a small check as it does a, a big check. Um, and what we have found so far, um, uh, just in, in round numbers, uh, thinking about going into a market and creating a structure uh, that would be appropriate for the market, that would be compliant with uh, all laws and regulations, and um, would attract the, the debt financing that we'd be looking for um, really takes an upfront spend, um, depending on the asset class and, and the market of anywhere between maybe um, you know, three to $500,000 on the low end and maybe up to a million or $2 million on the high end just to, to do the legal and accounting and structuring and, and business development and partnership work needed to make an investment like this be successful. Um, add into that um, what is you know, fi figuring out uh, tax regimes and regulatory regimes on a country by country basis, uh, determining if, if uh, as, as Joe mentioned, um, maybe introducing a leasing program for vehicles, uh, which um, may require you to comply with local banking laws or, or other laws related to finance. Uh, and determining uh, the right way to operate in the market, um, it, uh, that, that just becomes an incredibly complex uh, exercise in many markets that we've looked at. Uh, the, the other part of this, I think that we should mention, I've seen some of this in, in the chat as we've been going along, is that really to decarbonize um, by switching over to an electric fleet, you should be migrating the source of, of the electricity to renewables and the, the economics in, in uh, on most islands um, for both wind and solar are, are very compelling relative to fossil fuels. So there's not really a business case that I think needs to be made. It's already been made and assets are being deployed uh, across the world in a number of different island environments. Um, but uh, uh, what is uh, does create the complexity on, on many islands is working with the local utility to have the ability to, to build your own charging infrastructure that may include uh, generation, as well as um, uh, finding the land to build that infrastructure. So again, there's a really close partnership that's required with the utility and the government and probably other constituents in order to pull that off. Um, and uh, we, we would love to be deploying capital and, and looking more into this. Um, and and uh, I really think it's going to take a concerted effort uh, to, to coordinate amongst constituents and, and really partner long term in order to, to achieve big adoption quickly. Thank you, Eric. Um... I think, that's, I think that's actually a great uh, uh, theme on which to end, not so much a, a theme of pessimism, but a theme of realism that the potential here, the necessity here, as I said early on, we have to solve, solve this problem uh, along with other problems if we're going to really address climate. So we clearly, the potential is there. Uh, the future needs to have this, uh, but as you pointed out, there are a lot of practical steps along the way and, and actually to realize that potential is gonna take a fair amount of effort. 
um, or a great deal of effort. So uh, I think I think that's a good uh, theme on which to end. So that yes, I, we have now the um, uh, second poll. Uh, so I'll give you some time to um, to address this uh, poll uh, before we get ready for Q and A. And I'll have to ask, uh, you may have seen, I don't know how many of you, it's, perhaps it's a bit too culturally, uh, 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 whatever, specific for the US, but I don't know how many of you watched, watched My Cousin Vinny, but anyway, that's, that, you can see a reference to that movie in the, in the poll. So while we, while we wait for the poll results, um, let me just echo again, uh, obviously a phenomenal amount of uh, activity in the chat, a lot of activity in the Q&A. We will do our best uh, after this to uh, address specific questions, but I have um, uh, basically reviewed the, um, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, I, I'm getting notes about Marissa Tomei. Um, so I have reviewed the questions and I, and I would like uh, to, to attempt to, to kind of cover a few broad issues. And again, I don't want to limit the panelists. I know, you know there's only a limited amount of time. So if you have other issues you want to cover, feel free to kind of broaden the questions. But let me, let me raise one that I think several people have touched upon and it's a complicated one, but it may be, maybe you can make some progress on it. And that is how to reconcile, I'll call them equity issues or small issues and investment. That many of the, the groups that need help, frankly, or need to be supported, you know, uh, are not the high income groups and, and they're not gonna buy Teslas and put them in their garages. So that's, that's, that's a ch challenge and many islands are quite small. So as, as Eric was saying, don't really, uh, aren't necessarily the right place for massive investments. So I guess I'm curious if anyone on the panel could speak to how they might've seen perhaps at a government level that getting reconciled, making, basically making investments pay uh, yet benefiting smaller lower income communities. Sure. May I, 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 I go ahead, Marcelino. Yes, thanks. Just I, I think this is this is really an important debate, especially now given the fiscal situation of many of our countries. Is 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 an important question, but I think we we also need to recall that in many islands, the the, the major sort of risk to the economies is is financially is the high. Uh, uh, bill on oil imports, and, and 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 when you know oil prices are again up. And when the economy is 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 in such situation fiscally, then the poor are, are the ones who 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 don't get access to to government, you know, resources. So in reality, working on electromobility as a way to not depend too much in fossil fuels at the end will really benefit the poor. That's why it's important to not forget what is one of the most uh, fiscal. Uh, 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 um, uh, risk in, in many of our, our, our economies. And just to put this in perspective, the, the detailed analysis we did, for example, in Jamaica, what if the government put incentives reducing, you know, import duties and, and, and VAT taxes to electric cars? At the end, the economy as a whole could save 2% of the GDP, because remember, oil imports is a really huge bill for, for governments at the, end, at the end impact how they can spend on, on the poor. So, while yes, maybe the first one who are going to uh, um, get an electric car at medium or high income, those will help reduce the bill import of the country and that has a lot of benefits. So we have computed these benefits and you could say in, in the case of Jamaica, more than $200 million by putting incentives. Uh, imagine everything you can do with those resources to really support the poor. So I think that that issue that, that uh, that 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 really electric cars is is will benefit the, the rich is not necessarily true. In addition, remember uh, climate uh, change impacts are felt the most in the poor. So if we do nothing, the poor are the ones who are going to continue to be hit the most. So I think that's a false uh, dichotomy. We need to start somewhere, and who uses more fuel is people who drive more. But at the same time, is the, is the thing that brings us to more problems, you know, fiscally and with the ability of governments to 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 support the the, the poorer. So I think it's a false dichotomy. I think is the the numbers are are clear economically and fiscally. It makes sense to consume less soil. Is energy efficiency? Remember, electric car eighty percent efficient, combustion car twenty percent. You are losing eighty percent of the fuel that you don't have. As clear as that is pure efficiency in the economy. 
And I'll, I'll chime in here and say, I, I think this is a, a perfect place where um, some type of private public partnership uh, is, is absolutely key. And whether that's with a, a, a utility or maybe with a multilateral agency um, to, to making sure that uh, investment in this type of insurance, so decarbonizing infrastructure is it benefits all, all constituencies and all levels of income. Um, so we are doing that in a couple of our investments now um, in, in one uh, through, through one of our investment platforms in Latin America, the, the company that we've invested in is partnering with a local utility to install solar panels on uh, just a, a very wide range of houses. And you know, we're talking about thousands of houses at a time uh, of all income levels. Uh, so we, what we see in that company is that the, the customers that are coming to um, uh, this company uh, just you know, for their own benefit are the higher income houses. They generally range from call it six to 10 kilowatts uh, uh, systems being put on, on the roofs. Uh, what we are doing through the utilities is targeting a, a range of houses and, and installations that will probably be two or three kilowatts uh, a piece. So um, significantly uh, pushing that out into the market, the, the solar deployment. Um, we're also working, so uh, we have a fairly close partnership with now DFC, but we've been working with, you know, when it was OPIC and USAID separately for decades. And um, we are working uh, with that organization now to uh, provide potentially some credit support in another jurisdiction that would enable us to uh, finance customers with a much broader credit profile. Uh, so that's maybe not necessarily bad credit, but just less credit history or less demonstrable credit. Um, so again, you know, by, by partnering um, in one case with the utility and in a, another case with a multilateral, um, we're taking what we're doing on the investment side that just on a, I call it low hanging fruit basis is going for larger commercial and industrial and larger and wealthier residential users and, and using the partnerships to expand that into um, to a, a much wider economic breadth of market. Um, I would add to that, that I, I think what, you, what we're seeing is that the corporate entities and the government entities have the, the scale of fleet as well as the resources to engage in proper total cost of ownership analysis and stacked cost analysis. Quite often for the consumer, you look at the sticker price and, and you think, oh, can I afford that? Can I not afford that? But there's a whole life cycle involved. And um, what's interesting is, is that as we transition the energy toward the power plant in the island communities, and yes, we are largely driven by fossil fuels, but there's also the utility is regulated with its integrated resource plan for the introduction of renewables. So as we looked at the analysis for the environmental impacts or benefits of converting to electric, we both looked at the um, utility generation mix today and the forecasted utility generation mix with the integration of renewables through the integrated resource plan. And what it showed us is that if we converted our 110 bus fleet today, it will be the carbon equivalent of removing 1,500 vehicles, cars, off of Bermuda's roads. But in 2035, when the integrated resource plan is realized with the renewable energies, it becomes the equivalent of 2,400 cars removed off of the roads, carbon equivalent. So, so that's, that's very um, interesting and important to, to keep in mind that um, also associated with that is the cost of energy. And then as the electric vehicles scale up, we're expecting to see the cost of the vehicles go down. But in all of our um, stack cost analysis, what we're seeing from dealerships and manufacturers is that basically the operating and maintenance cost of an electric vehicle is half, if not less, that of an internal combustion engine vehicle. So I, I really advocate that the total life cost analysis 
of the vehicle, whether it's over eight years or 12 years, should be taken into, into account. Thank you. Other comments? I have a follow-up question. Anybody else like to comment on that? Once, going twice. So let, yeah, let, Roger, let me follow up a little bit, also tying this to a question that's been asked, which I think is a really, it's a very broad question, high level question, but actually I think quite important. And that is, um, to what extent have you or people that you're, you work with looked broadly at the uh, alternative investments? People have talked about hydrogen, biofuels, disposal costs for batteries, you know, uh, getting cobalt from the Congo. I mean, there are a lot of issues that are tied up with decarbonizing, different ways of decarbonizing, uh, different alternatives, different kinds of vehicles we could use. Again, I'm not, and I'm not kind of pointing fingers. I'm just curious. I'm a big fan of electrification, uh, you, you can tell. But I'm curious in the work you're doing in basically deciding, yes, it's appropriate to invest my money, someone else's money in this area. Have you been looking, have you considered some of these broader as you said, life cycle, total, total cost of ownership, total life cycle issues, and comfortable that where you are now, promoting electric vehicles, I'd say, is the right place to be. Broad question. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, that's a very good question. And you have to, when you're doing your analysis, you have to draw a line somewhere. As I said, some people may go into a showroom and just look at the sticker price. And then you can extrapolate that and say, well, no, I'm actually going to look at the annual operating cost. So you could say, I'm going to look at the life cycle cost that I'm going to own this vehicle. Um, for us, it was important that whatever reference point we took for the electric vehicle, we also took the same reference point for the ICEV vehicle. So at the same time, we didn't, while we didn't consider uh, necessarily the, the, um, the COBOL or the sourcing of the the products to make the batteries, we also didn't consider the sourcing of the iron ore and castings to make the internal combustion engine vehicle, et cetera. Um, so from our point of view, it was as a consumer from, from the point of um, procurement to the point of, of end of life of the vehicle. I'd like to, to take also on this on other technology solutions and, and you know you mentioned hydrogen hydrogen is, is, is of course is going to be a piece of the puzzle to decarbonize many energy uses but when you see specifically in transportation you know electric solutions are there already and you know electric buses 200 kilometers you know the average electric bus does not run daily more than 150 200 kilometers in major cities in Latin America so there electric uh, battery driven buses are there are proven uh, we have more than 2000 buses in, in using this latin america and the caribbean uh, that have run uh, millions of miles when you go to 500 kilometers you know between transport between cities at long distance 500 a thousand kilometers then yeah electric buses have a challenge and it's where hydrogen may complement so islands specifically you know because they are small uh, specifically for transport, for transport of people and goods, short distances, I really think electric solutions will be key and they are there already. So let's look on hydrogen for maybe ammonia production and other things, but let's not, uh, let's not uh, miss the point that we all at our homes have already an electric pump. That's really powerful. You don't need to develop the, 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 the hydrogen infrastructure, which is more complex, uh, but as I said, it's key for other sectors in transport, small islands, I would say short distances, uh, keep it on, on electricity because the numbers are clear, the maturity of the technology is, is there. Don't, 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 don't miss focus. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the other part of that is that, again, you run into the same problems with land constraints and the infrastructure and scale and to put hydrogen infrastructure. I mean, we saw how long it took LNG to get to the Caribbean and it's still mostly only on the larger islands. And there, there are still scaling issues across the region. Um, you know, if you take a, a smaller island that's even more remote, that's even more land constrained, you simply can't put the infrastructure in that you need to in order to support a hydrogen ecosystem. Uh, you know, we're, we are looking at vehicle investments and hydrogen infrastructure investments in larger economies that have the ability to support the entire ecosystem. And I think that will absolutely be a part of the mix for transportation 
uh, it, depending on where you, you are in the world. Um, but, but again, I think there are just a lot of factors for island economies, especially the more remote and the smaller they are, that just tip the balance way, well towards electric vehicles in, in, in the whole mix. I'll jump in here for a second if you like. Um, just on, on what, what we're doing, so like every other panelist is talking, we, we have uh, significant challenges with size and, uh, and how much, you know, things like renewables that we can have. Um, but we also, I don't know what, how other jurisdictions work, but we have a, a company that, that basically does the power on our island, basically the door to door, and they would do the, the purchasing and delivery. We also own our own energy corporation, which uh, owns a number of wind farms, um, some microgrid technology, some solar farms, that, that type of thing. We have kind of a mix of, of things that we are either doing or, or in the process of, of doing. And that gives us the ability to have, uh, have some flexibility. And uh, it also gives us the ability to generate some income that we can put towards things like our move towards electric vehicles. And the, the talk of kind of like the, the afterlife and, uh, and technology and technology companies, <clears throat> part of our move to our, our total plan, which is our, our path to neutrality, is to try to build an industry here. And uh, like I said, we're 155,000, give or take people, but we don't have oil, we don't have minerals, we don't have gold, we don't have the things that other parts of our country would have to naturally generate revenue inside of our, our province. Our, our main industries are farming and fishing, which I mean, they're, they're good, they, they, they treat it as well, but I mean, it's nothing like having a gold mine or uh, access to oil fields in your, in your country and they're, in the other end of the, they're at the other end of the country and you don't really benefit from them. But we, we view this shift as a real opportunity for us as a province to, this is our gold, this is our oil. We have lots of wind, we have lots of, lots of smarts, we have the ability to pump money into technology and, uh, and be leaders in this. And we feel that we can be leaders, not in our country, but we feel like we can be leaders worldwide. So we are in the process of building a clean tech industry up here on Prince Edward Island, right from the ground ground up where we'll, we're gonna have our, our own group kind of, we have a, announced a tax-free zone for businesses to come and either operate with their, their current business or to take an idea and, uh, and incubate it and, and help us solve some of the real world problems that we both we have and, and other uh, jurisdiction seven you know we hope that those things will include things like what do you do with cars when they're done like what is there can the batteries be reused is there part, pieces of them that we can reuse into new technology that will help you in your home or you in your business or you in your community I, you know that won't be for me to decide that will be for the innovators to, to decide you know exactly how that uh, that would work but some of the innovative things that are happening here right now are people looking at electric fishing boats and like i said fishing is our, our one of our top two industries on prince Island. and lobster fishing is would be the big 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 industry that we'd be into and uh, i don't even know how many boats we have like 5500 probably so if we can electrify even that we're going to take a big bite out of this too so we're we're trying to look at it from the perspective that we're, we're where everybody is we can and there's no reason to believe that we can't have what the richer jurisdictions have because we're going to invest in it at the at the ground level so um we hope that some of the you know kind of that get into the theme of your question we hope that we're going to be able to provide some solutions to the questions by having the people here who are going to who are going to solve them for us thanks other input Uh, someone what? mentioned the issue of, of, of electric ferries, and I just posted on the on the chat here for the audience. We we looked into that in, in Latin America, and we did some analysis if some uh, you know short distance ferries could be electrified. And to our surprise, there are like ten short route ferries in Latin America or more. I think it's close to fifteen that can be electrified today, short distance. You know, a few kilometers. These ferries that cross one island to the other. I think that's a, a really important segment that, that maybe the Caribbean could explore, especially this tourism type of, of alternatives. I, I just, um, you know, just call to the audience if you are interested on this segment. It, it, for us, it was really uh, impressive to see that many short routes in LA could be electrified as we speak, very short distance, uh, you know, electric ferries 
uh, in, in, in LAC. Uh, have a look at this report. Thank you. Yeah, there is interest in, uh, I've done some work in the uh, in uh, electric uh, electricity on on the water, basically maritime. Uh, it is another interesting topic. Um, let me ask, I think I have time for one more uh, kind of summary question um, that again, that we all touched on. And let me, let me uh, phrase, uh, kind of uh, uh, provide the context for that. I think what we've heard, uh, again, many people have experience in this, this area that there is kind of a business model for, for investing in renewable generation. That, that's well established and that's happening and, and, and uh, uh, that's great news. There's also an emerging business model perhaps uh, at the end use point, right? Uh, uh, selling vehicles, uh, uh, electricity rates, et cetera. The challenge, a challenge, not the challenge, but a challenge is between those, right? If you have a lot of electric vehicles and all of a sudden you have to upgrade your transformers, you have to you know, trench uh, in, you know, under some concrete. There's a, there's a lot of, there's a big step getting from, oh, I've got the wind blowing and I've got some electric power to, oh yes, I can actually charge up my car uh, economically uh, uh, and not blow up the transformer in some remote location. And I'm curious if, if any of you, maybe particularly the people that are more on the government side, but, but anybody um, sees emerging business models there because I do think that that it's not the last mile, it's many miles. That 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 transmission distribution grid investment's got to be made. Maybe has to be made by the government. Has to be made by utilities. I'm curious if people have any can have any experience and success stories there. Because what I hear, this even in the U.S., even in California here, this is a big challenge, right? That's that step is a big step, and it's and it's going to have to be made. So I'll see if anybody has any response to that. On, uh, let me take on that quickly on, I think on the distribution side, uh, one sort of key enabler to, to, to make at the end user more adoption of electric vehicles is to work on, uh, you know, regulatory frameworks that enable private citizens, private actors to invest in charging infrastructure. And in many of the Caribbean islands, the, the framework under which the electricity sector works is still very, very tight, very regulated, integrated utilities, when technologies are available like distributed generation and electric cars and they become uh, viable because now uh, 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 they become economically viable, that, that model I think uh, needs to be changed. So distribution utilities need to focus on distribution is a good opportunity for them because more electricity will be flowed through their wires business. So I think uh, you know moving uh, in that direction that distribution should be wires business because we will be able to produce our own electricity and put it into our electric car. I think that that um, moving towards those regulatory frameworks that recognize uh, these new technological advances is important. And specifically in charging, just to give you an example, in some cases it is illegal to put a charging port. It shouldn't be like that. I mean, it's electricity that I use at my home. I should be able, like I plug a, 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 an AC refrigerator or a, a large AC, I could, plug my car because cars can be, can be plugged immediately. I'm paying for my electricity. So just doing those uh, quick enabling uh, regulations, yes, private property, you can install your charging station, just follow these safety precautions. Uh, there are very small steps that can be taken. And then of course, moving towards a more dynamic regulation of the distribution segment. Utilities only have a winning position here, especially uh, if they look at the wires business, it's, it's going to be just better for them that all the oil that is flowing through pumps will become electricity that flows to the electricity networks. To align the incentives, yes, we need to work on that sort of regulatory reform. Do your electricity uh, wires business, the selling business could be gradually, you know, modify because even in the Caribbean, that, that type of decision makes sense because the scales are smaller, renewables are cheaper, and they are competitive also in Ireland. So we need to move gradually on that regulatory reform too. Thank you. Other thoughts about that in other jurisdictions? I, I would like to okay. add on the, on the point, I think there is an important role to be played there uh, in terms of time of usage rates as well. When we look at the load curve, certainly in Bermuda, um, we're seeing that you know, we, we have a base load capacity and then we have a peaking capacity that's typically sometime during the, the afternoon or the early evening. And um, I think with regulation and providing for electric vehicle charging tariffs and time of use rates, 
there's an opportunity, what we saw in the analysis, to actually contribute to a higher utilization of the power generation assets, which will provide a levelized cost of electricity. So the utility has to invest less in the more expensive peaking plant and can invest more heavily in the less expensive baseload um, generation, which will, will have a subsequent effect of lowering the cost of electricity for everyone. And um, what you do there is then you're taking advantage of the capacity that is in the transmission and distribution network at a time when it's not being utilized. Uh, I'll just talk about I talk about what we're doing. So I, I, I know I, I talked about our our total goals to carbon neutrality and that uh, the transportation is 44% of them. But we have a, a study we're in kind of in the final works of releasing it publicly. Um, but our study basically says that in order to do what we're trying to do in our first 10 years, which includes not just electric vehicles but electrification of home um, heating systems, we're we are a no northern jurisdiction, so it's cold here from I would say 125 days of the year, perhaps even more than that, I don't know exactly, but we use a lot of oil heat and that would be our primary heat source. So as we change people over to electrification, we're, our grid requirements are going to double. So double from what they are today, which is a significant impact and it's gonna be a significant cost because as we all know, capacity isn't um, that cheap when it comes to electricity. We have a, a solar initiative here on Prince Round, so the government helps kind of like our EV credit. We help, we'll pay up to half of your solar install on a home home install and we'll help you finance the other half of it if you can't, you know, if you're having trouble financing. So we feel like that's really generous and we have a, a number of people who have taken us up and that a good number, which is which is good. But we have to bring with that uh, a smart grid, a smart grid technology so that people can use their energy the time of day more more wisely than they, they do. And um, we, we don't necessarily need all that power on the grid when solar is capable of doing it unless we change kind of the habits that we have. So we're looking at how we change those habits. We're looking at microgrid te technology um, that will help kind of manage parts of our, our load and our, uh, our capacity issues. And uh, of course, like everybody else in the world, we're looking at storage and what that would look like and how that would help uh, our load balance. And we have a really big load balancing issue here because as I noted before, we, we produce 27% through renewables, but all the rest gets purchases, purchased off the island and it comes across the North Armand Strait in a big, a giant cable. And there's a load balancing cost that, that comes with that. And the, the rate payer here effectively pays for that. So we're currently undertaking, because of these changes and because of the things that we're doing, because of what's happened in the world, some policy changes and policy strengthening in our in our legislative branch. So we're looking at what do we need to do to make better policy so this can happen in a way that doesn't hurt the ratepayer and we can meet our goals and uh, and kind of have it all meshed together. So that's kind of how we're tackling it. Thank you. Um, so I've been reminded that we have to stick to schedule, which is good. I appreciate that we have so much energy uh, even this far into the webinar. Uh, let me, I don't know if James, you can, or Sarah, you can show the poll results. I know I skipped over those. But I guess what I'd like to do, uh, if we in fact look at the poll results or not, um, yeah, there we are. I just I thought I'd quickly show those. So uh, it looks like people. That's that was the first one. Do we have the second poll? I'm curious how many people care. But yeah. So so uh, quickly, I think it might be useful. Again, these are there's no right answer so much here, um, but it looks like people uh, still think that uh, total combustions. Um, uh, oh, actually, that's that's it. Yes, people are very optimistic about about EVs. That's good to hear. Uh, so, uh, and, and as an EV owner, I would agree with that. At least my EV is cheaper than was cheaper than buying a uh, and operating a, a, um, a an internal combustion car. So that's good. And let me see what people, how optimistic people are. And yeah, people are. Well, there's a very optimistic crowd. That's great. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, we have a, a very very short time left, uh, maybe five or six minutes. But what I'd like to do at this point is give each of the panelists um, put them back on the spot. Um, and in a minute or two, uh, minute and a half. Uh, maybe minute 29 as I talk longer. Um, what I'd like to do is give each of you a chance just to kind of highlight what is a key lesson you've learned that you want to impart on the audience or a recommendation for going forward. Uh, and let's start this, let's do a reverse order. Eric, can I put you on the spot first? Uh, basically, what's your uh, top of mind uh, recommendation for the, or lesson learned? I, I guess what I would say is um, 
I, I like I don't think there's going to be any one solution uh, to the the um, decarbonizing the economy. Uh, there are a lot of technologies, a lot of business models, and a lot of ways approaching things that will emerge as successful. Uh, I think there's a lot of value in doing things that work now and then improving constantly as we go along. And um, yeah, I think we've gotten to the point now that the cost of inaction is way greater than um, potentially sub-optimizing on the action that we're taking. Uh, so I'm very optimistic. I see a lot of very interesting uh, solutions in the market and a lot of people doing very good work. And um, yeah, I think I think we should be as a, as a community supportive of uh, many different ideas and ways of implementing. And um, I'm optimistic that we'll we'll do a lot of good work over the next 10 or 20 years. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Joe, yeah, you're next. Well, I just saw a huge opportunity coming out of the chat. Um, at first, the statement shocked me, which was along the lines of, on some islands, diesel cars make sense because of boats bringing diesel there. No, this is a mindset challenge. And I think it's also a great opportunity. So what if we shifted our mindset from thinking, hey, boats bring diesel, therefore it makes sense to maybe the boat shouldn't be bringing diesel and maybe there are solutions that we could do to ensure energy security inside. So if everyone wants to look at mindset when you look at decarbonization, I think that can make a big difference. Thank you so much, Marcelino. Yes, I think one, one lesson, you will save money. That's key. And we've seen it when we have deploy and finance electric car solutions in Costa Rica, in Barbados, or in large deployments. You save money. And, and I'm, I'm telling about you know deploying hundreds of cars and buses and what we have seen in Latin America. And also, you know, personally, anecdotically, I bought a used electric car. I haven't been happier than never. I don't spend a dime on fuel now. When I put the numbers, it really makes sense. On the Caribbean, there is a lot of import of used cars. It's much better to import a used electric car than a used combustion car. It definitely it pays. Uh, so, so to advance that, there are very short actions that we could take, simple on the enabling environment, you know, incentives, charging infrastructure, and, and understanding that uh, uh, fiscally it will be better also in the long run. So, I, I, but I would say the main, you save money. Thank you, I would echo that, personal experience. Uh, Roger? I would, I would, my takeaway would be that electric vehicle technology is mature and it is maturing. It's mature enough for the island jurisdictions by far. Um, the real challenge in front of us is EV technology is disruptive and we cannot rely on traditional players to have the EV agenda at the forefront of their minds just like we saw in many other environments and technologies, when it's disruptive, you have new players emerging. And I think it's gonna be interesting to see more players like Megapower emerging in other island communities that are gonna to help to thread the needle as well as government policy and regulation that sets targets and clear commitments toward electrification. Thank you. Minister? Well, thank you. I guess my takeaway and uh, what I would recommend to anybody who's going to go down any type of decarbonization road is, is be bold and don't be afraid to be bold. And I think that uh, Joe is 100% right. He can't, it's not good enough to say this is why we could, this is why we should avoid decarbonization. Be bold. You, you're going to be on the right side of history on, on this one. Um, don't be for, and we still have it here. So don't don't think just because we're doing all these great things that there's not people that don't believe that we can do it, don't believe that we should be doing it, and don't believe that things aren't good enough the way they are. Their history is going to prove them wrong, and it's our job to lead. And it's everyone's anybody who wants to lead this can lead this. It's it's your job to be leaders in this, 
and the whole world is going in, in this direction and the whole world has leaders that are, are going. So don't be afraid to be bold because I think that you're going to be surprised how many people are actually going to follow you when you go, go down the That's road. Okay. I just want to close by saying, uh, re reiterate the point that I made. If there's people that are interested in having further conversations, reach out to me. The, the organization, if the organizers could share my, my contact information, that would be fantastic. Um, we will help you. We will partner with you. We'll welcome you here to see what we're, we're doing. And uh, we'll give you access to the people that we have here who have been leading our charge for us because I believe in this. And I believe that, that if there's anything that we can do to help anybody else in the world, then we should be there and vice versa. If you have something you can offer us, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. If you wanna come here and do business, I'd be more than uh, happy to welcome you, you here. I think that we're in this together as a world, thanks. That's good. Great closing. Uh, I, I like that at a personal level, uh, be bold. Uh, be on the right side of history uh, for those of you that have children uh like i do I mean, my, my kids are older but that's one of the important things i want to be on the right side of history with my family and everyone so i think that's a great philosophical perhaps personal but i think a great comment um we're, i think we're just about out of time what i wanted to do was close with a couple of follow-ups uh i think i'll work with the organizers we want to be careful about about contact information making sure it's okay but i think the organizers and and, and i will work together to make sure we reveal only that that would you like to reveal uh, but I think it'd be great if people are open to having follow-up directly. Um, I also want to mention very quickly um, just a few follow-up items that you can pursue. One is there are, in fact, a couple of conferences uh, that many of them are U.S. focused, but a couple are international. As I said, CREF, the Caribbean Renewable Energy Forum, planning an October session, we hope in person, uh, and there will be an electrical mobility day or session for that. Uh, there is an Africa conference coming up in October. Also, there's supposed to be an electric vehicle day. It's a smart mobility conference in October. Both of those uh, you should be aware of if you'd like to be interested or like, like to pursue uh, activity in the Caribbean or in Africa. There are also several uh, sites that have good information. Uh, of course, IDB is one, but there's also IEA, the UN, as well as an organization called the International Council on Clean Transportation, ICCT, a wealth of information there. There are also online total cost of our operation tools, including one that Nathan has. Uh, so if you want basically to do some analysis of your fleet online, there are some very good tools that are generally available for free on that front. Uh, and again, if you're interested in those, you should contact me directly. And again, I think uh, James is gonna put all this information in the chat, but I would like to thank everyone, the panelists in particular, as I said, I thought it was a great panel, great set of panelists and this confirmed that. And I'd also like to thank the sizable audience uh, for participating and taking the time for this. But anyway, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the organizers, James, Sarah, Audrey, the organizers of Island Innovation, and look forward to success generally in this area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye all. Thank you all for a wonderful panel. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.